Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Palestine Chronicle TV. This Wednesday, we have a very special guest, Eve Engler. Eve is a Canadian uh, author, journalist, activist, and advocate of human rights. He has written extensively on Canada's foreign policy, Canadian domestic politics, and of course, Palestine and Israel. We're gonna bring in uh, Eve in a minute here, but before, we just want to um, say something about what happened in Lebanon yesterday, the tragedy uh, that is really unprecedented, not only in Lebanon, but really anywhere in the world, perhaps since the American bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one of the most devastating uh, and heart rendering bombs and, and uh, tragedies that have inflected and affected uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, so far, we know that hundreds have been killed and thousands have been wounded as a result. And we know that this number is unfortunately going to continue to rise. So we are going to just show a little video here and think about Lebanon and the Lib Lebanese people who have our complete love and solidarity during these difficult. Welcome back. Uh, first, let me bring my um, uh, uh, co-editor and uh, co-host, Romana Rubio. Welcome to the show, Romana. Hi, Ramzi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I really hope that your connection can do us some justice uh, because it's a little bit uh, blurry, but I'm sure that it uh, will eventually. Yeah, maybe because I'm sharing. Tell us a little bit about our guest, uh, Romana. Yes, of course. Uh, we are honored uh, to have our guest, Eve Engler, with us tonight. We are going to discuss uh, Canada's anti-Palestine records and many cliches uh, that surround uh, this country as a friendlier and amiable uh, country. Uh, and Eve, with his work uh, as an author and as an activist, uh, demolishes some of these cliches and speaks truth about uh, his country, uh, his records on human rights, on Palestinian rights, uh, on, on the friendship with Israel on so many levels. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, well, uh, without further ado, please uh, welcome our uh, guest, Eve uh, Engler. Um, hi, Eve, and thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, Romana started talking about the, the cliches. And, you know, I live, I live in Seattle, not the, very far away from Canada. And I tell you that there is this idea that Canada is different. Canada is better. Uh, it's different not just on foreign policy, uh, if compared to the United States, uh, you know, but also on Palestine and Israel. Canada is a friendly country. But this is not exactly the case. Uh, Canada has its own imperial ambitions and and that is going to uh, help me introduce uh, your latest book, I believe, Left, Right, Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada. We're going to be talking about your other books as well. But this is very important for, um, for us to kind of help sit you with the reader here to know uh, where Canada actually stands on many issues uh, regarding foreign policy, militarism, uh, armaments, and, of course, Palestine and Israel. So I guess the first question is, how did Canada achieve this reputation of, of being different, friendlier, more amiable, especially if compared to the United States? Uh, well, I think that if you, if you compare Canadian foreign policy to U.S. foreign policy, it is better. Uh, but that's, uh, that's damning with faint praise. I mean, if you compare to the worst and you're a little bit, little bit less bad than the worst, um, that's not uh, saying a whole lot. The reality of Canadian foreign policy is that Canada has been close to and has a, had a privileged place with the two most important empires of the past 300 years, the British Empire 
uh, and then in the last 60, 70 years with the U.S. empire. And uh, the Canadian government has uh, all kinds of advantages in terms of, you know, why we're so confused about Canada's role in the world is because um, there's a very powerful propaganda system in this country. Canada speaks the two main colonial languages, English and French. So it has the ability to really put out its uh, perspective on the world. Um, the, the lack of formal external colonies. I mean, there's internal colonies with regards to First Nations Indigenous people, but the lack of ever having formal external colonies gives a sort of uh, a plausible deniability around, uh, around uh, you know, being a colonial uh, power. Um, but, uh, but, I th- but also there is a, I think there's a unique uh, mythology within Canada as well of just this being a benevolent force uh, internationally. And, and like I kind of mentioned, Canada's foreign policy <clears throat> is driven overwhelmingly by two things. One, support for empire, historically British, today American, and support for Canadian corporate interests abroad. That is overwhelmingly what drives Canadian foreign policy. And of course, you see that play out um, with regards to anti-Palestinian positions. And it's important for people to realize these anti-Palestinian positions that Canada pursues uh, today are not new. They're, they're grounded in at least a century of, uh, of uh, a Zionist uh, policy uh, in this country. And, and if I do want to go back to that history. It's essential that we, we do, especially because of also you have uh, written about this issue before. And so it's, it's, it's very important that we get your view about the, the genesis of that relationship between Canada and Zionism and eventually Israel. But let's start from the very end here. What happened on June 17th? Canada was denied uh, a, a seat. And reason behind that denial, that at least has been cited by many newspapers um, and various media platforms, is that Canada's bias towards Israel. First of all, is this the case? What happened on June 17th? Well, Canada lost uh, its second consecutive bid for a Security Council uh, seat. Uh, the Current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who is a you know a liberal uh, politician, liberal party, and is you know viewed as a liberal, um, put a lot of energy into winning that seat. Uh, put a huge campaign, called dozens uh, dozens of uh, leaders around the world, uh, you know, pushed very hard for that that seat, um, and uh, and Canada was defeated actually quite uh, badly by Ireland and Norway on the first round of voting. Um, and uh, the, I would say the, we don't know what countries voted in which way. So we can't, none of this, this all of this is a little bit speculative. But to my mind, uh, there was no issue that contributed more to Canada's uh, loss in its bid for Security Council seat than its anti-Palestinian uh, record. And more specifically, not just its anti-Palestinian record in general, which is extensive we can get into, but specifically its uh, voting against United Nations General Assembly resolutions that almost the entire world supports and the Canadian government uh, consistently votes against those resolutions, in some instances isolated with just the U.S., Israel, Micronesia, Palo, maybe one or two other countries. Um, and so the, the, uh, that, I think, was the number one issue and uh, in, in Canada's Security Council defeat. Um, and... Uh, Activist groups, uh, which I were, which I was part of, we um, we pushed on that issue. Uh, we um, Just Peace Advocates, a very good Palestine Solidarity group, uh, f- found the whole record of Canadian the Canadian voting record at the UN over the past two decades on UN resolutions. And um, while Canada voted against, I think, 166 resolutions over the past 20 years that, in one way or another, were upholding Palestinian rights, Ireland and Norway, the two countries that Canada was competing against for that. So there's two seats in the Security Council, they didn't vote against one single one of those resolutions. And we, we pushed that issue very hard. And, and the letter that was just uh, put across the screen was the Canadian uh, ambassador at the UN after our campaign uh, uh, a week before the vote at the Security Council. This is after four years plus of Canadian campaigning for the seat on the Security Council. He was forced to send this letter to all the UN ambassadors basically claiming that we were lying about Canada's record over Palestine, uh, trying to like 
basically come up with like an alternative that they voted against one resolution in November for the first time in multiple years. They voted in favor of one resolution upholding Palestinian rights. And, and so, um, again, I can't know for sure why countries voted against Canada, but the fact that our ambassador in New York felt the need at the late stage to send this letter to all the UN ambassadors was because we were pumping out uh, uh, more than 1,300 individuals sent letters to all the UN ambassadors criticizing Canada's position on Palestine. So it, it's almost certain that Canada's uh, anti-Palestinian voting record and anti-Palestinian policies more generally uh, contributed to Canada's defeat. This is incredible. I mean, it, it really kind of shows, and, and tell me how you feel about this, Romana, it, it shows how, you know, you know, grassroots activism can actually penetrate this high level of policy making. It's one of very rare examples that we haven't seen much of in the past. Yeah, I think the, the action of activists like Eve Engler is really uh, important in this sense. In fact, uh, today um, we published an article by Eve um, calling for his country to end the Canada-Israel free trade agreement and, you know, mentioning the, the protest that the demonstration that is planned uh, next uh, Sunday uh, against this, uh, this uh, free trade uh, agreement. So the question that I want to ask you, um, how does Israel uh, buy its influence in Canada? Uh, and is it for economic leverage or more for political leverage? or for his um, massive propaganda, so um, influence over the media as well? Yeah, I would say it's a bit of all of the above. Um, there is a long history of Zionism in this country, and, and Zionism didn't actually begin as a, uh, a Jewish movement in Canada. There's a, there's a Christian Zionist movement that predates the, uh, the, the, the Jewish Zionist movement of, of uh, Herzl and, 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 and the late, late, 1800, uh, late uh, 1800s. Um, and so, and it was tied into Canada being part of the British Empire and this, uh, the most famous early Canadian Zionists called for a dominion uh, uh, of the British Empire uh, of, in, in, in Palestine. Uh, just like Canada was a dominion of the British Empire and, and, uh, and so it would be connected in with Canada uh, in that sense. So there's a long history of that. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Jewish Zionist uh, movement uh, in the early 1900s, there's a, there's a significant uh, uh, Jewish Zionist movement. Canadian officials have been tied into, you know, British imperialism. And while the British Empire saw Palestine as, a, as an outpost, Canadian elites generally followed that outlook. And then, you know, today when the U.S. Empire sees uh, um, uh, Israel as as an outpost, Canada tends to follow that round, uh, follow the U.S. Empire. Alongside that, there is a uh, very well organized uh, uh, pro-Israel lobby in this country. Groups like the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, uh, B'nai B'rith, uh, Friends of Simon Weisenthal Center, and and a whole slew of other smaller organizations that are. Um, able to uh, exert influence over over the media, like Honest Reporting Canada. It's, it's a media flack organization that all it does is criticizes media outlets that express even a hint of sympathy to the Palestinian cause, and they attack them, and, and, they, and, and, they, and they, quite frankly, they do it quite well. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, there's organization, organizations like that. Um, there, you know, the influence of, of money in politics plays some role in fundraising. I would say at a much lower level than in the U.S., Canada has much uh, clearer restrictions on, um, on the uh, funding of politicians. So, in, so there's no one like Sheldon Adelson in the U.S. where, you know, he gives, you know, 100 million or a couple hundred million dollars to Donald Trump and that, you know, prods Trump into even more extreme anti-Palestinian positions. That similar dynamic doesn't exist in Canada it has, in anything of, approaching that that level. Um, uh, but the but the you know the dominant media is 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 very much you know it's always been sympathetic to the Zionist movement. So you can go back you know 100 years. So that it, you know there's long history, and in the last couple of decades there has been more of a uh, organized and active pro-Palestinian movement. Um, so that, to some extent, counters the, the dominance of the, of the Zionist narrative. 
but but it's uh, it's still you know very much the media is still you know not interested in challenging power and uh, and the the uh, you know pro Israel groups are able to you know attack. I mean, there's just recent example of a of a of a, a progressive restaurant in Toronto that boldly st- stood up for Palestinian rights, and they basically you know they've been they 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 taken on, you know, defunding the police. And, and they wrote, uh, you know, uh, one time they wrote like, fuck the police. Uh, 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 then another time they refer to Canada Day as KKK Canada Day. So, you know, strong positions on, uh, on you know, defunding the police, on the colonial history of Canada. And they're criticized for that a little bit. But then when they put out some, some strong uh, uh, messages around Palestine, it's like the whole world comes down on them and the whole pro-Israel lobby in Toronto uh, uh, completely morphs what's been said as if, it's, as if she's, you know, hate speech, anti-Jewish. When in fact, if you look at her, the, the position she's made, yes, maybe they're a little bit, um, you could argue even maybe a little bit childish in some of the language she uses, but she's consistently bold and straightforward on a whole series of progressive issues. And it's only when she takes up the, the Palestinian cause in a bold way that she gets smeared as being anti-Semitic. She gets attacked uh, uh, viciously. Um, so that, you know, those kind of incidents uh, scare other organizations for standing up. And there's a whole lot of fear in the, you know, in the pro-Palestinian movement even. There's just incredible levels of fear about being labeled anti-Jewish or, or, you know, saying something that maybe you didn't use the exact right word. But if you, you know, engage in all kinds of other um, elements of, of, you know, politics, you know, oftentimes people say things that aren't exact right word or, and, and there isn't that level of sort of like basically, uh, you know, uh, terror. Uh, and that's in large part because there is this very well organized um, uh, pro-Israel lobby that will um, come down hard um, for those, you know, standing up for Palestinian rights. You know, we've been talking about uh, uh, restaurants. Uh, if, um, is there any update on what happened there? Oh, the update is she survived. There is, you know, despite if you were to just pay attention to the media or to, um, you know, kind of the dominant ethos out there, it's like the whole, all of Toronto hates food vendors and is all hostile. But in fact, the this, this, this story is I, I haven't been in touch with the owner directly, but in talking to some uh, pro-Palestinian people in Toronto, she's finding support. There are people coming in and, 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 and supporting her, you know, in fact, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, it, you know, sales were down anyways and nothing to do with the with the with the the recent uh, uh, controversy but uh, more people are actually coming in so 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 uh, things are going well but there is this lawsuit right I mean there was a series of suits against her one lawsuit for eight hundred thousand dollars for this for this uh, interior designer who 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 says that he on his uh, Twitter talks about how he he's a IDF soldier uh, a, a retired and and he he just he talks about when he became active in, in, in campaigning for Israel was in 2014. In other words, when Israel uh, uh, killed 2,200 people in, in Gaza. Um, and he's complaining that she referred to him as a terrorist uh, because, you know, he lists himself as an as a, as a Israeli soldier. And so he's actually suing her for $800,000. Almost for sure this lawsuit will be thrown out. But the whole objective here is just to make life so difficult or you know a single mother who runs a, a runs a restaurant, and it's just one element of this ferocious campaign uh, against the restaurant. And um, and uh, but but there, like I said, there has been some uh, some solidarity. So I, I think it looks pretty good that she's going to be able to survive, and uh, and hopefully it can be a bit of a, a stop to the uh, onslaught of the Israel lobby. This is excellent, uh, excellent news, and I will give you the chance. Romana, I just want to share this uh, question. I know that you've touched uh, on this issue uh, even. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about it because here in the US, um, as I've also experienced um, a similar you know, kind of political cultures to some extent, of course, in the UK, France, Germany, and elsewhere, you have this kind of clear apparatus of a powerful you know, pro-Israel lobby, uh, and then you have the, the, so many arms and influences over media, over various sectors, and, 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 and therefore that kind of penetrates into, you know, kind of an up-down approach, in, in, you know, where ordinary people in the street have 
you know, pro-Israeli views sometimes without really much information or, or much education to back up these views. So um, one of our readers here is asking, um, you know, about the political motives and the economic motives in, in uh, Canada's uh, ties with Israel. Is it really just a, a historical support that has been building up over the years without much resistance to counter it? Or are we talking about other elements here to the story? Well, I mean, I think there are many elements. I, I think that, you know, the Canadian military, Israel is a very successful military power. I mean, it, it it's, produces weapons. Its military is clearly a very successful military. There are the upper echelons of the Canadian military like having connections with the Israeli military. If you look at uh, different military manufacturers in Canada, they have uh, relationships with Israeli man, uh, military manufacturers. Um, there is a, there is a, still is a smaller than in the U.S., but there is a um, organized Christian uh, evangelical uh, Zionist movement in this country. Uh, like I mentioned previously, there are groups like B'nai B'rith, uh, Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, and others who are very well organized uh, Jewish pro-Israel uh, 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 lobby in this country. Uh, there are, um, uh, like I mentioned, historic connections to the British Empire. Uh, Canada's ties to, to Washington as a general uh, element into understanding Canadian foreign policy. If you look at what Washington is supporting, Ottawa tends to go in that direction, not just about mm -hmm. Palestine, but from Haiti to Venezuela to so so there there are you know uh, uh, many facets uh, to understanding um, the dynamic. I don't believe that economics per se is that important. Canada-Israeli trade isn't that significant. Um, uh, there are um, very wealthy Canadians who are, you know, who have major investments in Israel, uh, like the Bronfman family or or um, uh, uh, and the Adams, uh, 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 Sylvian Sylvian Adams. Uh, uh, so there, there, you know, there are you know connections uh, uh, like that. Um, there's the element, like I mentioned, there's the element of it's a unique situation where you have a, a pro-Israel lobby that's aligned with power, uh, that's uh, aligned with power in the sense they're aligned with, you know, the U.S. empire, aligned with power in the sense they're aligned with Israel, which is a you know, powerful country in the Middle East, aligned with power in the sense that, that as a general rule, uh, the Jewish community is a, is a uh, successful community uh, in Canada. But then alongside that, they have the ability uh, to claim victimhood. Right. So while they are, you know, supporting the the uh, Israeli military, you know, killing defenseless 14 year olds in Gaza, they're able to claim that they are the victims of of, uh, you know, discrimination or whatever. So it, it's, it's quite a unique. I, you know, I, f I focus on many different elements of Canadian foreign policy and there's many lies in Canadian foreign policy. You look at Canada's role in Haiti you'll find that the lies the Canadian government puts out are pretty, pretty astonishing and what they're actually doing versus what, 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 uh, what they say they're doing. But I, I think there is something uh, unique in this instance where there is an organized, uh, very um, uh, committed uh, 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 activist movement that's aligned with power, but then has this ability to claim victimhood um, and, and, and that really has a, a dampening effect on people, uh, you know, wanting to uh, point out the obvious, which is that, you know, Palestinians are being oppressed and they have long been oppressed. And, and, uh, and uh, what, you know, Center for Israel, Jewish Affairs and B'nai B'rith are justifying is, you know, horrendous and is completely immoral. Um, but they frame it as that, in fact, that they are the victims rather than they are the, you know, perpetrators of uh, injustice. Absolutely. And um, so the influence, the, the pro-Israel influence is very clear from your words, but from your articles and your writings, it is also clear that there is um, a resistance in Canada um, that is able somehow to offset the influence. So do you want to talk to us about, you know, how uh, our groups organize, how is BDS organized in Canada and activism, pro-Palestine activism in Canada works? 
Well, I mean, it's it's organized uh, mostly at the grassroots level. Uh, so there are dozens and dozens of groups across the country that have their primary focus uh, standing up for Palestinian rights, you know, from uh, uh, students of solidarity with Palestinian rights to uh, coalition against Israeli apartheid, to Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, to independent Jewish voices, uh, you know, in different cities. Um, so there are, you know, many groups. Um, they they tend not to be uh, particularly well funded or or particularly uh, uh, you know institutionally strong, uh, right? Like the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs has something like forty plus uh, paid employees, whereas Independent Jewish Voices, I believe, has like three or four. Center for uh, um, uh, Canadian for Justice and Peace in the Middle East has maybe two or three. Uh, so there's, you know, far better organized on the on the pro-Israel uh, side. Um, but the pro-Palestinian groups are, are you know, generally volunteer activism, uh, people who are, you know, very committed to the cause. And, and um, polls show over and over again that the public is much more sympathetic to the uh, Palestinian cause than what appears in the dominant media or than what even appears in the official political realm. So, you know, there's an, a recent poll confirming uh, uh, other instances where, you know, Canadians are very sympathetic to the idea of, of uh, boycotting and sanctioning uh, Israel uh, for violating international law. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but polls say, you know, more than half of the, the public are, are, you know, sympathetic to that idea. Um, but that's considered totally out of bounds in the official uh, political realm. Um, so, so what the you know the activist groups are are trying to do is one they're obviously trying to trying to uh, you know consciousness raising and you know explain some of the history of the scope of Palestinian dispossession, Canada's complicity in that process, but also um, you know take some of that uh, uh, diffuse uh, uh, public sympathy and and, and you know uh, channel it into into actual you know, uh, organized uh, uh, campaign. That's one of the things that the Security Council uh, campaign did, right? Whereas we, you know, channeled some of that sympathy that's out there into a very specific target uh, and had, I think, a, a, you know, a small victory uh, on, on blocking Canada from sitting on the Security Council. Uh, there are, you know, one recent example is, you know, with the, with the whole annexation uh, uh, push, um, there's, you know, uh, I think it's about 75 plus members of parliament Who've, who said that there needs to be clear actions that the Canadian government takes if Israel actually moves forward with, with annexation. Um, uh, you have all kinds of, you know, very targeted uh, uh, BDS campaigns, some of them that have had some success. One of the arms companies here in Montreal, CAE, uh, it backed away from one of its relationships with an uh, Israeli company, I think in part because of some of the campaigning. Um, so, so, you know, the organizations, I think there's, there's many of them. Um, they, there's greater and greater sympathy among the broad progressive uh, uh, movement for the Palestinian cause. If you go back 30, 40 years, uh, the unions were often actually quite aggressively supportive of, of Zionism. Today, that's no longer the case. Now there are many, many unions in Canada, labor organizations in Canada, that have passed resolutions uh, supportive of the elements or the entirety of the boycott, divestment, sanctions uh, campaign. Um, whether they act on it enough, maybe not. Maybe I would like to see them be more, you know, more uh, forthright with their activism on these issues. But you know, at least when they have their uh, their you know general assemblies where a thousand or two thousand members are there, the vast majority of the members uh, are are you know vote in favor of of these uh, uh, actions. Um, so yeah, so it's a you know it's a social movement. It's a social movement that's you know fighting against the power structure, like all social movements. It's it's a uh, you know, it's marginalized, um, and then at some point you just win, right? After enough effort, you, you just win. But uh, but it's obviously from the standpoint of Palestinians, that's uh, um, uh, you know uh, difficult to uh, to um, to accept that process. Absolutely. Uh, just very briefly, we want to talk about your books. Your latest book, uh, Eve, is uh, "Left Right Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada." Uh, there is a previous book that we also uh, mentioned uh, earlier, Canada and Palestine, Building Apartheid. Uh, we are going to be showing, uh, sharing uh, some of these links uh, uh, below in the comment section uh, and, and uh, 
and elsewhere. Um, just quickly, I want to finish with this, Eve. Um, you've, you've been doing this for, for quite some time now. Um, do, you, do you feel hopeful that despite of the, the, the power of, and the influence of the Zionist movement in Canada, and do you feel that the future is for a more truly friendlier and more amiable and more fair and just Canada regarding Palestine? Is it happening? Are we already in that process? What will it take? I think it's it's undoubted that the level of awareness and sympathy among those who would identify as being progressive in Canada, uh, that their sympathy for Palestinians is much, much greater today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, I, I don't have any doubt about that. If you if you go back in uh, you know 1947, 48, when Canada contributed very uh, negatively on the partition plan, which was of course very unjust for Palestinians, um, there was almost no dissent in Canada over that. There was a little bit of a dissent. There was uh, you know some elements of the Arab community that did that did dissent uh, that did you know criticize Canadian policy. But from my understanding, there weren't any protests on the street. There wasn't any. Um, now you fast forward to today, and you know, uh, unfortunately, it's it's you know only usually when the worst of of Israeli uh, uh, human rights violations take place, like in 2014 and the you know destruction of Gaza or, or other instances. But you often have 5,000. In I've been in demonstration, 10,000 people here in Montreal in support of Palestinian uh, rights. Um, usually, you know, the one coming up on Sunday, that's probably going to be more in the three, 400 people kind of range rather than in, into the thousands. Uh, but still, it's, a, you know, a street protest. It's reflective of the fact there is a, um, a uh, you know, there are many, many, many people in Montreal who are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Now, at the same time, we can't deny the fact that the liberal government, uh, just like the, the, the conservative government, even more pro-Israel government, is staunchly, staunchly anti-Palestinian and um, is, you know, just horrific, quite frankly, on 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 their their policy on the matter. Um, so, what it what is it going to take to to take that uh, opinion that's getting more and more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and break through in the official political realm? Um, you know, I think there's many elements to that. I think there's got to be some changing geopolitical dynamics with regards to U.S. power in the Middle East, in China. Uh, there's got to be elements of, of change within. Within uh, within Israel and you know more division among uh, Jewish Israelis, also uh, you know the, the the Palestinians within is within Israel proper, and then uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and 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 you know uh, uh, greater mobilizations. Just just today in the Hill Times, the Palestinian Authority's representative uh, in uh, in Ottawa has this just horrific interview where she she basically praises the Canadian government as being. You know, a defender of, of Palestinian rights. It's just, I mean, it's really quite embarrassing to. to it, it just, just considering what happened at the Security Council only a couple of weeks ago. I mean, how can you not know these things? And, she, and they ask her about that. They even, and she refuses to say whether Palestine, Palestine contributed to the to the. To the <laughs> even while you have you have the Canadian ambassador in New York writing a letter, making it very clear that he believes. That the Palestine question is central, but the Palestinian representative of Ottawa won't even answer that answer mm -hmm. that question. Um, so, so, so you know, those are some of the dynamics. Uh, and then you have, you know, within Canada, you have a uh, you know well organized uh, uh, pro Israel lobby that that is is uh, very influential. You know, what what is it going to take to uh, to get over the hump? I don't know. I, quite frankly, I mean, I think the, the only thing that you know. Uh, uh, internationalist minded and, and uh, um, you know, uh, solidaristic people can do is just just try to keep working at it and do what we can. I mean, the reality Absolutely. is- I, I think that's your answer, Eve, right there. It's just the consistency and the resilience of solidarity that will eventually make the difference. We have seen this happening in many other cases around the world. And uh, just before I finish, I'd like to thank you very, very much, uh, not only for taking the time to talk to us today, which was very informative indeed, uh, but also for all of your contributions to the Palestinian cause and to influencing the discourse on Palestine in Canada, among other issues and other subjects that you 
deal with as well. Um, so thank you very much uh, for taking the time. Thank you, and thanks for the, all the great work that Palestine Chronicle does. And uh, thank, thank you, you. Brother. Take care. Um, also, we would like to thank uh, our other contributors uh, on Palestine, um, uh, aside from Eve uh, Engler, who has been a regular writer for the Palestine Chronicle for years now. We also have Marion and Hanna Hawass, Jim yeah. Myers, uh, um, as well, who's uh, kind of joined the Palestine Chronicle more or less about 20 years ago and still one of the most uh, consistent and, and excellent book reviewer and commentator. Um, Romana, your thoughts on this? Yes, and they, uh, it's very interesting to see how everybody um, underlines the hypocrisy, you know, of this liberal government. Um, it, for example, uh, what impressed me in, uh, in Eve's book uh, is a chapter dedicated to liberal politicians in Canada boasting about not voting UN resolutions condemning Israeli violations of human rights, of Palestinian human rights, or, for example, the stance that Canada uh, took um, uh, regarding ICC investigation on Israel. So their contribution as authors and activists is so extremely important because, you know, it unveils the, the, the hypocrisy and uh, of these, uh, you know, liberal uh, politicians that sometimes it's not clear, not even to Palestinian politicians, as uh, Eve just. You know, I, I feel like uh, the, 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 we have the same uh, issue of misperceptions regarding Canada uh, that we suffered from here during the Obama years. For mm -hmm. 80 years, liberals here, uh, even many among the progressives, have been hailing the president for his uh, revolutionary ideas. There's been this ridiculous... Um, um, kind of description of, or, or you know, a depiction rather of Obama of being a Che Guevara of sorts. Uh, yeah. While in actuality, his his title, as we spoke about it, the deporter and chief in South America because of the three million uh, innocent uh, souls that he had uh, basically dumped across the border, uh, sending them back to war zones, to conflict zones, and so forth. Uh, and, and his uh, terrible track record on Israel and Palestine, giving Israel the most generous foreign aid package that it has ever received from anybody ever. Uh, and yet they continued, uh, many people, until today, they continue to praise Obama as of being fairer to Palestinians, and, uh, uh, and especially if compared to uh, Donald Trump. And I think uh, the, the same issue is happening in Canada has been happening for years, no matter what Trudeau says or does. I mean, um, that's another issue which, uh, I, I wanted to raise with uh, Eve, but we run out of time, regarding BDS, the fact that Canada was one of the first governments to actually condemn BDS. Yeah. Uh, Americans are still really struggling, at least at a federal level, to find the right wording uh, in their anti-BDS attitude. The Canadians were one of the first Western governments to push the anti-BDS um, uh, you know, uh, law uh, uh, in that country. Um, so we are going to finish with this. Um, again, we are going to finish where we started, uh, just paying a tribute to um, the people of Lebanon. Um, you know, Palestine and Lebanon has um, have you know always been very very close. Um, as Palestinians, we've uh, really kind of always seen Lebanon as a second homeland uh, in many ways, and uh, it is incredibly tragic. Uh, what has happened yesterday. And of course, there is much more to that story than uh, we think we know. I think only time will tell. So we're going to finish with a, a short footage uh, from yeah. that day before we end. Our one little thing that I want to underline, you know that since the moment of the terrible explosion, the Palestine Chronicle is following closely uh, what's happening in Beirut and with a live blog. And one of the news today was that um, as the Beirut governor announced that the, the explosion left up to uh, 300,000 people temporarily homeless, uh, the news reported that Palestinian and Syrian refugees living in the outskirts of Beirut offered their homes and also their blood to help the victims. So I really think this is, you know, a sign of 
humanity from Palestinian and Syrian refugees living in very difficult conditions. We all know that. And, you know, that's yeah. and, and also, uh, we uh, shared a, a photo gallery today from our photographer in Gaza, our photojournalist rather, in Gaza, Fawzi Mahmoud, of the some of the vigils and some of the events are being organized uh, in solidarity uh, with the Lebanese people, but this is something to be expected. The Lebanese um, also stand, always stand in solidarity with Palestine and its resistance to Zionism for many years. Just one final, and I really, really hate to finish at a negative note, uh, but that statement we reported on today by the former Israeli uh, Knesset member who described uh, the explosion in Lebanon uh, yesterday as a gift from God. For Israel, it, it doesn't get any um, brutal and sinister than that, uh, but yet somehow it's not entirely surprising either. So we're going to finish with this footage and we thank you again uh, for joining us. Please support the Palestine Chronicle because this content that you see today and the content that we produce every single day throughout the years is only possible because of you. Your $5 or $500, whatever the amount you can afford, is what makes our uh, work possible. Thank you so much for your support, for your solidarity, and for tuning in. Goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. I'm good, I'm good. Come, 